Yeah, so, so I was thinking in this context to uh, maybe rapidly go through some of the things we've been developing, uh, I think, in the Danish context that we now see uh, have um, a kind of uh, a currency or an actuality in, uh, uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, of, of course, our, co our company is based in, uh, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, we have very committed uh, colleagues. Uh, but of course, we originate uh, in our headquarters in uh, Valby, uh, and um, uh, two two things we've been sort of developing, I think, in sort of Danish soil. One of them was the idea that sustainability didn't have to be like compromise or this sort of Protestant idea of taking cold showers. Uh, that sustainability could actually be a way to improve improve our quality of life, improve our enjoyment. And, and the first time we really coined that, uh, that term was when we uh, worked with uh, uh, the official Denmark uh, and with the funding of Raldania to create the Danish pavilion in Shanghai, where we tried to consolidate experiences like the Copenhagen city bikes, uh, so that you could actually... It was the ideal museum for impatient people. You could bike through the whole thing in, uh, in only five minutes. Uh, also, we uh, recreated the, the harbor bath of, uh, uh, of Copenhagen, this idea that you don't have to drive for hours uh, to get to the beaches, you can actually jump in the port in the middle of the city. So that means that an environmentally progressive city is not just good for the fish, it's also great for the, for the people living there. Chinese visitors could experience how clean, if not how cold, uh, Danish uh, harbor water is. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we even sort of, uh, as a way to lure uh, the Chinese to come and, uh, and check it out. We, we kidnapped uh, the mermaid. We had to get her out of the hands of Dansk Folkeparti. Uh, then we had to get her through Chinese customs. Uh, and finally, we, uh, we got her into uh, to China. Um, so that was sort of one idea where you can combine this idea of environmental progressive thinking and technology with uh, uh, a sort of a human-centered uh, uh, agenda. Uh, another idea that we've developed over the last decades is something we call social infrastructure. Uh, and where it used to, in the 60s and 70s, purely refer to the amount of kindergartens or nursery homes in a, in, a, in a community, we mean it much more literally that you can actually imagine infrastructural projects like uh, highways or power plants or flood protection in a way that it actually comes with positive social side effects. And I think the strongest example of this is a building we're doing uh, right now here in Copenhagen. And I suspect it could be a new landmark for Copenhagen but it's not going to be uh, the Royal Theatre or the Opera or even uh, the Royal Palace. It's going to be a power plant where we uh, turn household waste into electricity and, and heating. And because these waste to energy power plants work on an economy of scale uh, for maximum uh, efficiency, this is going to be the biggest and tallest building in, uh, in Copenhagen. It will replace the power plant you see next to Copenhagen Marina. Uh, it's right next to the cable park where the locals go water skiing. And we thought, like, how can we celebrate that this is a clean technology and make it an asset for the community and not just a big ugly box that casts shadows on the neighbors and, and block the views? Um, and we were thinking, um, you know, we do actually have snow in, uh, in Denmark. We had snow like uh, three days ago. Uh, but we have absolutely no mountains. But apparently we have mountains of garbage. So... Um, we have to go six hours by car to Isabel in Sweden. Uh, we can actually create two-thirds of the main slope of uh, Isabel on the roof of this power plant. So we propose to make um, you know, a power plant with a giant accessible sloping roof complete with pine trees and hiking paths. Um, insanely, we won the competition uh, based on this proposal. So suddenly we had to uh, deliver on, uh, on our ideas. Uh, you might have uh, noticed that uh, we won zero medals in Sochi. Uh, we hope to improve on those statistics because now uh, Danish skiers can actually practice uh, at home or from, from Christmas 2017. Uh, there'll be a public hiking path. Uh, you can enjoy the view of the, of the horizontal city of Copenhagen. There'll be the tallest climbing wall in the world, 100 meters. Um, and in a way, you can say that the diagram I showed in the beginning that portrays a city like a man-made ecosystem is quite close to becoming a reality with, with this power plant, because not only does it use available resources like the precipitation on the roof, uh, natural ventilation, but it also creates a, almost like a, a, an urban metabolism together with the citizens of, uh, of Copenhagen. 
also as a uh, yeah, so we've been building it over the last couple of years. I, I can really promise you that it won't feel like skiing on the roof of a building. It really feels like a piece of uh, of Danish bedrock uh, rising 100 meters out of the uh, of the port of Copenhagen. Um, the reason that we could actually win the competition on such a crazy idea is because it is the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. So you only have a little bit of steam and a small amount of CO2 coming out of the chimney, no toxins. Uh, so that means that where you would normally want to be as far away as possible from a power plant to not suffocate, now we almost literally have clean mountain air on the, view, on the roof of this power plant. And by choosing this design, uh, the CEO of, um, uh, of AMA Resource Center, uh, which is the name of the company, she wouldn't have to spend fortunes on ad campaigns and pamphlets because it's blatantly obvious to anyone this is, this is a new kind of technology with whole new possibilities. To take this like the, the last step, we actually designed the chimney in such a way that it accumulates steam. Uh, and then at regular intervals, it puffs a gigantic smoke ring or ring of steam. So, so instead of the chimney being a symbol of all of our failures, uh, the emissions, it becomes a celebration of our successes that every time we've reduced the emission of CO2 with one ton, we celebrate it by puffing a gigantic smoke ring. So, um, so, so typically people would argue that this only works in a sort of a socialistic uh, Scandinavian country where the market forces have been put out of place. Uh, but uh, we, we actually got invited to, um, to sort of try to see if, if some of our thinking could translate to uh, Manhattan bedrock. We got invited to look at a building on the west side of uh, Manhattan. And it's basically sandwiched between a power plant and a waste management facility, in this case separate, not combined, and, uh, and the west side highway. And we thought, what they really need is an oasis. Uh, this is uh, Hornbeck Hus by Kai Fisker, where my dad grew up. And it's essentially, you could say, at the architectural scale, what Central Park is at the urban scale, an oasis in the middle of the city. So our simple question was, what happens when you combine the density of an American skyscraper with the communal space of a Danish courtyard? Or what would a court scraper look like? Uh, so we basically place the courtyard on the waterfront. We give it the, the density of a skyscraper by lifting the northeast tip to 500 feet. We can still get sunlight. Uh, and views over the Hudson from the south and the west because we keep the southwest corner the height of a handrail. This was our first conceptual model. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, it, was, uh, it was recently uh, awarded the, um, uh, the best skyscraper uh, in the world uh, in the last two years uh, in Frankfurt, um, which is pretty nice because it's not really a skyscraper and it's definitely our first building that's taller than 10 floors. Uh, but, um, but I think what it does, in a way, it, it, it takes uh, you know, a uniquely uh, European, let's say, and, and very Copenhagen uh, form of uh, communal space, uh, the courtyard. So you know, when you enter into the, to the lobby, you are invited to uh, explore all of the social spaces that have been uh, sort of consolidated around this uh, courtyard, which even though it is you know, surrounded by something that is the height of a high-rise uh, to one end, it actually comes all the way down to the, the height of a human uh, and actually brings some of the, the social qualities of the Danish courtyard into the heart of, uh, uh, of Manhattan. And, and the architectural results of bringing these two unlikely typologies together are also uh, rather striking. People keep sending me photos when they land in Newark and Teterboro uh, and, and keep doing it because like, the, the, the photos make me very happy uh, when, I, when I see this. Uh, but, but essentially... Um, Having just arrived in, uh, in New York, um, um, we were located in, uh, in Lower Manhattan, and after two and a half years, uh, Sandy came, uh, the hurricane, and wiped out um, most of, uh, of southern Manhattan. According to a New Yorker cartoonist, it gave rise to a whole new neighborhood in, uh, in New York. And, and we got invited by the city of New York to look at making all of the necessary flood protection for uh, Manhattan in such a way that it would not become a seawall segregating the life of the city from the water around it. <clears throat> and we looked for like interesting uh, precedents. And, and one of the things we, we uh, came upon is that 
the most popular or the second most popular park in New York after Central Park is uh, the High Line, which is essentially a piece of decommissioned infrastructure, former rail yards that have now been given um, positive environmental and social programs. So we thought, what if we could design the necessary resiliency infrastructure of Manhattan in such a way that we don't have to wait until it gets decommissioned before we make it nice? What if we could actually make it from the beginning with positive, premeditated social and environmental uh, benefits? Um, and looking at New York, uh, New York as a city has very much been shaped by the clash of these two giants. Uh, to the left, you have uh, Robert Moses, also known as the power broker. He was a very powerful public servant that realized that most of the very important uh, public projects of, of New York over a few decades, including the highways on the waterfronts, uh, the housing projects, the parks, um, but often with a very devastating impact on the local community. At some point, he tried to run the Trans-Manhattan Highway through uh, Greenwich Village, and he uh, encountered resistance from Jane Jacobs, who was living in the village, she rallied the local community and in a sort of David Goliath moment, she defeated uh, the plans and she saved the village. So we thought, what if this project that we've come up with that we call the dry line, essentially the high line that's going to keep New York dry, uh, could be conceived as the love child of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. Uh, because to resist an incoming a storm surge, you need 10 miles of collectively coordinated hard engineering, but to make it socially successful, it needs to happen rooted in a close dialogue with the local community. So uh, we came to the city of New York with the idea that we would reach out to uh, uh, different groups from the local communities on the waterfront of Manhattan, and together with them, we would design all of the necessary engineering so that it would actually answer some of their concerns and realize some of their dreams. Uh, so we made this short film where you can see some of the people from the community that we worked with. You can hear their experience from Sandy, uh, uh, their concerns and their dreams for their future waterfront and, and, and what it's going to look like. That was actually why Sandy was so bad is uh, because of the phase of the moon, it was already a very large high tide as well as the storm surge coming in with the, the wind and the tide lining up perfectly to give us 14-foot tides <laughs> instead of 8-foot. The most shocking part of uh, Hurricane Sandy was the fact that it, it, uh, it exceeded expectations. I think the sheer magnitude of it caught a lot of people off guard. When Hurricane Sandy came, we were not prepared at all. I mean, not even the slightest. Yeah, it was like an alien invasion of water. And not the good kind of water. So yeah, I mean, it came right in front where the, there was literally boats on 14th Street floating in front of our in front of our window. We had a sub-basement level office a block from here, and it was totally covered in water for two days. So we lost everything, everything. We're really concerned about another storm and the flooding that's possible, and we think that the next time it's going to come even further inland. I'd like to see some type of flood protection in this area. Um, that's going to happen. Um, we're vulnerable, obviously, being as close to the water. Something that just brings like uh, more walks, different walks of life, you know? Uh, another escape from just the busyness and the hustle and bustle. Um, there's this great space that could really become community space, cultural space, and, and, and active uses. Everyone enjoys space. And uh, in New York and other congested cities, it's hard to come by. Anything that makes the cities greener is just such a wonderful thing for 
Not only the environment, but the people that live in the city too, to be able to be around that space. Uh, the plans, the berming, the sense of how it can become into the natural landscape itself, uh, how we want to program that is, uh, is, is, is really the next challenge. We are the link, we are the tip in the sense of the big U. It's important that the entire waterfront of Lower Manhattan uh, build in the plans that have been put forward because we can not only fortify this great city of New York, but be a model for cities all over the world. So, so basically, uh, we, we won this, uh, the, this project, and we are now uh, uh, scheduled to break ground in 2017 on the, on the East River portion, and we are also working on the, uh, on the south tip of, uh, of Manhattan. But essentially, this idea of, of through like a very sort of uh, interactive dialogue with the local community to transform the necessary uh, flood protection measures into something that actually enhances uh, uh, the access and the enjoyment of... Uh, uh, of the Manhattan waterfront. Um, I'm actually slightly shy of 20 minutes. I have one more thing that I wanted to show, but maybe I can do it in a, in a crazy uh, uh, sort of uh, high, high speed kind of way. Because uh, out of all this has come, because I mean, of course, like arriving to, to New York, uh, but with a sort of set of, uh, of values that is very, uh, you know, Scandinavian, let's say. We, we have then uh, met, uh, among other uh, people, the, the people from, uh, from Silicon Valley that are now involved also increasingly in, uh, in environmentally progressive technology. And, and, and we got invited with, uh, by Hyperloop, uh, Elon Musk's uh, vision for a, a high-speed um, new form of transportation, to, to, th to work with them on, on uh, how this could actually transform uh, the way we move around our cities and the way we think about our urban landscapes. And I'll just give you the very short uh, version of it to leave some space for, for conversation. But essentially, the idea is to have a vacuum tube uh, that eliminates uh, 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 air friction. In this, to have uh, transporters that are pa passively magnetically levitating, so there is no uh, resistance. And within this, you can transport car cargo or passengers, uh, and you can even mix and match uh, you know, different forms of cargo, different forms of, of passengers. Um, so it basically has the cargo carrying capacity of, uh, of shipping uh, with uh, the speed of, uh, of uh, flight, uh, with the energy efficiency of rail, uh, and with the individual freedom uh, of the car. Um, and basically because it happens inside a dedicated tube, it will be safer than any form of transportation. Uh, it can sort of tunnel uh, and be piped so it can uh, reduce uh, congestion. It's the most energy ele elegant and energy efficient form of, uh, uh, of travel. Uh, the, the convenience, because it can actually be on demand, uh, so you don't have to wait for a train departure. You can send these off every 11 seconds. Uh, and finally, it's, it could uh, replace less uh, energy friendly forms of transportation, making our uh, cities cleaner. And because it's so compact, it can easily integrate into uh, existing uh, pieces of infrastructure or, or tunneling. So um, we got invited by Hyperloop to imagine what this could look like, and we've uh, made a, a deal with uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi to, to look at their region as the beginning of a, a Hyperloop. And just to give you an idea, it almost allows you to hyper-jump, if you like, from uh, the uh, outskirts of Abu Dhabi to the outskirts of Dubai in, in less than 12 minutes. Just to give you an idea, to, from Dubai International Airport to Abu Dhabi International Airport, you can do the trip in less than 10 minutes, replacing where the, the fastest way to do it right now is by plane in an hour and 20. They've proposed a, a conventional train that's going to do it in an hour. Um, and we tried to look at what could be the experience of this sort of future form of transportation. So, like, of course, airports and train stations have a varying degree of orientation or convenience, but none of them are on demand. You have to wait until the scheduled departure. Uh, then, of course, in a taxi stand, you have more of an of a on-demand capacity, but at the expense of range and speed. And, and we were thinking, like, what we imagine is something much more uh, similar to the elevator lobby, 
that you basically arrive, you ask for, you, you tell them which floor you want to go to, and then the uh, door lights up. So basically, this is going to be a form of transportation that's going to be completely smooth, uh, uh, convenient, uh, you know, uh, direct to destination and, uh, and on demand. Imagine an interface more like that of Uber, uh, and where this idea of the departure gate lighting up uh, the way that an elevator door lights up and say, this is where you have to go. Um, so basically, the, the, the way that the tubes arrive to uh, these arrival and departure points that we call portals uh, is essentially uh, making a, a small loop that allows people to get to uh, the pods. Uh, the transporters, they remain inside the vacuum tube and basically uh, empty out these uh, arrival pods uh, uh, in the same way people have already loaded into the departure pods. And the pods can also go beyond uh, uh, the trains. As soon as driverless uh, cars become legal, they can actually take you directly to uh, your destination. And, uh, and just like two, two examples, um, uh, the Hyperloop station in, uh, uh, in Abu Dhabi, where we have eliminated the grand waiting hall because you don't have to wait. You basically just arrive and get to, to your part, and, and then you take off. Uh, and at the base of Burj Khalifa, we imagine integrated in one of the fountains, uh, one of the fountains lift up and invite people to go inside. As you arrive through, your handheld device will light up your departure pod, uh, and from here you can and continue on to, the, to your destination. So basically, we, we hope that this could be something that is seeded in, in uh, Dubai uh, uh, in 2020, uh, that could maybe expand to Qatar in, in 2022, uh, and from here to, to grow to, to the region beyond. Uh, and just to, to give you a sense of what it's going to feel like, we made this like, sh short film that, that gives you a sense of, of what could be the experience of the, of the future of, uh, of land-based transportation. Thank you, Piaga. I don't think I have.